So I don't, I don't know how you, <laughs> I don't know how you follow an act like that. Okay, so if we have the slides, um, okay. I'm, I just want to point out that, um, oh, how do I want to say this? I, I tend to be more serious about things. So, for instance, um, there were all these, and some of you may have thought it was jokes about um, the four horsemen and all that type of stuff. And I just want you to know that actually I take, <laughs> I'm a, I take my position and job very seriously. So this is not a joke for me. Now how, how I ended up with a white horse, I'm not sure. But <laughs> okay, so, and that, that's actually outside, that's, that's in Giza. So moving on. And I realize now I can't see the slides I'm looking at. Okay, here we go. Um, so what I want to do really is that they have not given me enough time as um, same with all the other speakers, so I guess we're all even. Um, but I am Robert Schock and that's my website um, if you're interested. I'm going to talk about several things, some of which you've heard a little bit about um, already today, some of which I'm sure you've heard about, but I'm going to just breeze through these slides um, because I have 294 and I really do want to get through them. Um, so we're going to talk about the Sphinx first, a little bit about the age of the Sphinx, and everyone knows where the Sphinx is on the Giza Plateau. This is just to give you a feel for what the Sphinx looks like, um, you know, seen in front of the due east, as you've already heard of the second pyramid, um, just some views of it. And really the question comes down to what is the age of the Sphinx? And you've all heard this, but I'm going to rehash it just a little bit. There's the Sphinx and the Great Pyramid. Um, and it really is traditional dates, 4th dynasty, circa 2500 BC, reign of Khafre. Um, and really what I've been doing, and there are two other geologists, I want to point this out because sometimes there's um, misconceptions about this. Certain Egyptologists, for instance, will say, oh, no other geologists agree with shock. Well, in fact, the only two geologists that have actually spent any time looking at this specifically, um, David Coxill and Colin Reeder, despite the fact that the three of us, and we're all independent of each other, may not agree on all the specifics. In fact, Colin Reeder in particular is trying to push it into a dynastic framework. We all agree that the Sphinx is older than the traditional date, um, that you know, the, we all agree as to the basic erosional processes, et cetera. Um, by my dating, and this is very, whoops, very conservative, <laughs> <laughs> Very conservative is at least 5,000 BC. And what I mean by that is a minimum age. It has to be at least 5,000 BC. Could it be older? Um, yes, but I'm not going there at this moment, when I say this moment in this talk at this moment. Um, but it's certainly, oh, one last thing, it's certainly been <laughs> repaired, <laughs> repaired, and the head's been recarved many times. So the, it is not the original head, as far as I'm concerned. This was in one of the local papers. Um, so I guess it's supposed to be me, but I don't know. <laughs> and of course, the inscrutable Sphinx. Um, why isn't this advancing? Come on, come on. Um, whoa, oh, went too far. Whoa, okay, so there we go. So here's the Sphinx. This is the Sphinx Temple, as you all know. Well, if you don't know, you know now. <laughs> um, the Sphinx, and there's a lot of repairs on. For instance, you can't even see the original paws. Um, they're all covered up. The Sphinx sits in a Sphinx enclosure, and a lot of the geological work is actually not so much on the body of the Sphinx because it's been all mucked about by Egyptians over the course of um, both recently and over the course of millennia, including the Fourth Dynasty. There's Fourth Dynasty repairs on it, so how does that jive with it being originally um, carved in the Fourth Dynasty? I don't know. Um, but what we've really been looking at, what I've really focused on is in particular the Sphinx enclosure, the weathering, the nature of the weathering here. And I'm not going to get into a lot of uh, detailed um, geological analysis. You, um, if anyone wants to talk to me, we can talk about. But bottom line is, is this caused by water? This is basically precipitation, what we can call precipitation-induced weathering, rainfall, runoff, et cetera. Um, there's uh, us in our younger days, um, perhaps. There's, um, he, he, he really should not be in that photograph, except this, he, it's a good scale. <laughs> <laughs> no, so so, so uh, John West always provides a good scale. But what you see here is, this is a little diagram, you see this rolling rounded precipitation, and a fellow named Gallery actually did 
trying to disprove me in part, um, um, and he tried to use this to disprove me, but works the opposite. He did an analysis of actually the hardness of the rocks, and the higher numbers, for instance, are harder rocks. Notice that this was a wall that probably went like this originally, and notice how, in fact, it's eroded further back where it's higher, even though these are harder rocks. Is that making sense to people? Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't get that except that, think about rain running down, beating on it. Where's the brunt? At the top. And when you're eroding away limestone, I'll give you a quick geology lesson, eroding away limestone, as the water becomes more saturated, you've got the brunt here, and as it rolls down, it doesn't cause as much effect. Does that make sense? This, this is just such classic textbook stuff. Um, here's another picture. This is from a cartoon from the Mystery of the Sphinx video that an NBC show that may, some of you may have seen. These are some cartoons showing. Okay, so there you're getting the erosion in the Sphinx enclosure. Same strata. And so the people have tried to argue with me that this is not the same strata. It absolutely is. Um, you can walk it, you know, walk out the stratigraphic correlations. This is a fourth dynasty um, uh, tomb. You, if you look closely, you can see some hieroglyphics here. Do you notice how this is a different type of weathering? Can you tell the difference? Yeah, yeah. See how you've got original surfaces here, and then basically this is wind. to oversimplify wind picking it out and picking out certain layers. But it's just a very different pattern. I think most people can see that. Here you see, look, beautiful wind tunnel effect, et cetera, et cetera. So wind erosion versus rain erosion to oversimplify things. Um, here you have, again, this is from the cartoon. Here's my um, beautiful diagram. But in fact, this is real. This is not just schematic. This is, this is real. I mean, this is, uh, this is real data plotted here. And which is this, rain or wind? Rain, and this is wind, if you have the same. And you see this at the different positions. And the bottom line is that we know, um, and this is just classic geology, we know that since about, well, according to this diagram, since about 3100 BC, um, it's been super arid, super dry Sahara region, but before that you've had temp, um, situations, and Robert Bouval already talked about this, where you've got more moisture. Um, it wasn't Sahara Desert as we know now. Before that actually it was drier again. So you have these alternating climates. Bottom line, just based on the erosional um, evidence and, and the weathering evidence and tying that in with the factors that must be causing that, um, the Sphinx has to go, and I'm saying this as strictly as a geologist, has to go at least back into this period. So, and it has to go far enough back into that period to get the tremendous amount of weathering erosion that you see. Does that make sense to people? Yeah, okay, I'm just, because I'm oversimplifying a lot of this, and you know, if you ask questions later, um, I can give you more detailed answers. Just going to Sakar Plateau very quickly, you see this? This is a, these are, there's a series of first and second dynasty um, mud brick um, mastabas. This is just dried mud brick. Guess what? A little bit of water touches this. What happens? Poof. Goodbye. Okay, this is not very far from the Giza Plateau. If there were all these heavy rains that are supposedly eroding the Sphinx in dynastic times, why are these still here? Why are these guys still here? You know? Once one, okay, one theory, uh, a friend of mine who's a geologist said, you know, okay, one theory is, well, maybe there were different climatic conditions between these two plateaus about 10 miles away. Namely, there was a black cloud over the Sphinx. <laughs> <laughs> and it just sat there. <laughs> he, he, he's also the same guy that, um, uh, when I first presented this at Geological Society of America, I guess it was back in 1991, um, I showed him the data and whatnot. This was, I was just talking to him. This was before I gave the um, uh, general presentation. You know, uh, West and I were there, et cetera. And I showed him the data, and he started laughing hilariously. And I said, well, what's wrong? You know, I thought I made some horrible mistake. And he said, no, it's just so crazy. No one ever knows this before. Yeah. Um, yeah, so bottom line, he agreed with me. But um, so these are supposedly by conventional wisdom, and here's more. See how beautifully those are preserved? Um, uh, by conventional wisdom, much older, you know, by centuries than 